Today we're taking a look at entertaining in the great outdoors. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. I don't know about you, but I love to, when the weather's cooperative, move many of my indoor activities outside, such as entertaining and dining. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm getting the table ready for a summer party, early summer party with these gorgeous guardian delphiniums. Now, one thing to remember when you're entertaining outside, if you're using cut flowers like this, you wanna make sure that it's the last thing you do because the sun will certainly make them wilt. In today's show, I wanna take you around other parts of my garden and show you where I love to entertain. We'll also take a trip to New York and learn about some of these beautiful containers designed for the poolside. Plus, I wanna share with you a get together. I had to celebrate the completion of the house here at the farm. You're not going to wanna to miss that. But first, we're gonna start in my outdoor kitchen where Terry and Kathy Guetta show me how to take care of the granite surfaces they installed. <music> Come on down, Kathy and Terry. I want you to see the outdoor kitchen. I'm very excited about it. And I'm telling you, it's starting to get some use now that we're shifting from summer till spring. Just look at how it's finished out. We've got it styled and been using it. And it's, it's really been one of the great additions to the garden home retreat. You know, since we've been using it, I've, I've had some questions about the surface because it's so beautiful and we all work so hard to not only choose the right granite in this case that would work with the stone and the brick and and also just the installation of it was quite involved now i have questions about the care for instance uh, could i use this as a cutting board or is that a big no-no uh, absolutely not i use mine all the time for cutting i chop my meat my vegetables cut up fruit and in fact terry very often uses the leftover piece where you cut a sink out and he makes a cutting board for many of the clients. And so they, that's what they do. They use it as a cutting board. Remind me of the name of this, this one again. This is Santa Cecilia, comes out of Brazil. What we really like about this kind of material, especially for outside, is that we can hone it, which means we take the polish off, and it makes it just a lot more user-friendly for the outside environment. I mean, it, it works good because uh, it's such a durable material. Well, I like the matte finish it has, I guess, which is a result of the honing. Are there any things that I need to be thinking about and watching for? The thing that you do not want to use is an acid, an ammonia, a bleach, or vinegar product. And make sure those items are not in your cleaning solution. You know, from a, the standpoint of it going through the seasons, a lot of people think, gosh, an outdoor kitchen in my, you know, my neck of the woods, it gets so cold in the winter. Of course, it gets very cold here. I have to say that the entire kitchen out here came through the winter beautifully. It came from outdoors. It was quarried out of a mountain. <laughs> yeah. so It's been outdoors for millions of years. That's yeah. right. It, it has been. So it's a wonderful product to use outside. It's a, just a great surface for anything. It, if you'll notice, most lasting monuments or um, in, anything like that, structures that are left these days are made of stone. Yeah. So it, it's the most durable. Well, I just have to say, I so appreciate your help from the beginning, the selection process through the installation, and now helping work with me on the care. I'm, I, just, I just love this part of the, the entire property. Well, you know, the nice thing about it, Alan, the more you use it, the prettier it gets. And so you'll have many, many years of really a lot of durable surface for your outside. I love that. <music> Having a pool party is always exciting and fun, but you know, sometimes the pool itself can take up much of the available space. 
Recently, when I was in Long Island, I met up with Butch Starkey, and he showed me some beautiful poolside containers that add beauty to the area around the pool without requiring a lot of room. I love this arbor up here, just a perfect little shady spot. I know, spot. you need it too, especially today with this whole warm <laughs> weather we're having. Yeah, can you imagine what that looked like with all those flowers on Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's a shame that we missed it. This is a great space. Isn't it? It and really this is, is where the rubber meets the road. Everything that we talked about and how you can practically now uh, use container gardens in your in your backyard, in your landscape. Yeah, well, the, the, the place is peppered with them in beautiful ways. Well, what's really nice about it is that you have to soften it up. You need the brick, you need the access to the pool, but at the same time, you want to be able to soften it up. Yeah. And then with the colors that they chose and how it ties into the coping around the pool. I think yeah, the really tile nice. with the little dolphin around it, and then it's echoed with all these cobalt and various colored blues uh, around its very good. I think good. they did an incredible job, and uh, they're very good, normal, regular customers of ours, so <laughs> we, uh, we really appreciate them. I bet. You know, what's amazing to me is that this property really isn't that large. They have so many beautiful elements incorporated into well, it. Well, that's one of the things around this area. This is a standard size property in this area, and that's why I love uh, landscaping in this size, because you could do so much with uh, a small budget. Yeah. So what, what do you think this is, 60 by 40, something like that? Uh, the backyard area, yeah. Standard lots in our, in our neighborhood, about 60 by 100. Yeah. By the time you take the house and everything else sure. out of it. Well, here, I mean, you've got a pool as a centerpiece. You've got plenty of lawn furniture, a place to eat, that beautiful little pergola, its own garden room. Hey, and you even got an outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, you know, the vegetable garden, they have it all tied in. And one of the things that I talk to people about when, you know, to do a plan is that this can get overwhelming if you, you start budgeting a pool and a patio. But at a minimum, we say start on your border landscaping and let your plants, you can get smaller plants, let them mature so you can have your privacy. Yeah, so go to the periphery and that's what they've done here. They've planted lots of lovely evergreens of various yeah, kinds. Yeah, and they have their privacy and uh, it works. And then, then if the pool comes later, you don't want to have to destroy any of your landscape or your investment. Well, in this garden in particular, it seems like all the border plantings are um, evergreens or deciduous shrubs. Yes. You've got the uh, pink spirea in bloom um, and a wide range of, of conifers as well as broadleaf evergreens in the way of hollies. A few perennials and then they've added color through the containers. Absolutely, I think the containers just complement the, the landscape. I love it. And uh, the other thing too I love about containers is uh, people live in these, their yards pretty much year round. So you can do seasonal plantings. This can be changed out later for mums. You know, tie a couple of corn stalks up to the pergola <laughs> and you, you have go. a fall scene. In yeah, there. give it's, it a little it's seasonal much touch. Year round, sure. Yeah. Lighting in our homes and gardens brings a magical quality to an evening or a special occasion. Over the years, I've found lanterns to be an ideal way to usher in a spark of enchantment. One of my favorite lanterns is actually not a lantern at all, but an old wire basket reinforced with chicken wire such that it can hold nine votives. You see, it provides just enough light to guide them into the garden after twilight and at the same time say welcome with its warm glow. Other lanterns are less improvised and are designed to withstand gusts of wind and rain. These I place on tables or stack along the steps as a guide to guests or hang them from iron shepherd's hooks in the garden. They hold votives or pillar candles and battery operated LED lights when an open flame is not possible or desired. You see, I've found these lanterns in some of the most surprising places such as yard sales, junk shops, and even flea markets. They're fun to collect and they're equally fun to mix and match. For several years now, I've been working on this idea of a garden home, literally creating one, a place that blurs the lines between indoors and out and expands our living space out into the garden and our garden back into our homes. The garden home is my expression of this concept and it's finally reached a point of completion that I can share it with visitors. Although it will always be a work in progress, I decided it was time to invite some of my very close friends and family out to the farm to celebrate this exciting occasion. I've been a lifetime gardener, farmer, and uh, 
looking around the grounds here, I see all this beautiful stuff, but I also see that the way it's laid out and everything, it's doable by most anybody who wants to do garden and farm work. They can create this on their own farm. Allen building the retreat home is a bonus for me. Um, eventually on the property we hope to build our own home. There is a farmhouse that's over 100 years old uh, on the farm, but we would like to build our own next to it and use that as a retreat center for our church and whatnot. So getting ideas in the house is a bonus for me. And I like the colors and the textures of the different plants. Um, companion planting with flowers and vegetables grouped together helps prevent a lot of insects from eating on the vegetable plants and they're great companion. And this is beautiful here with the colors and the textures of the different plants. And knowing that this was going to be open today, you know, obviously uh, made us wanted to see it in real life. Especially working with, uh, with the containers and putting different plants in the containers to see what I need to put here, what I need to put there, and to, to come out today and actually see it just makes it more vibrant and, and I think even more interesting. One of the things I've, I've enjoyed about coming here as well is we the place that we have has a lot of open land like this originally did and it's a real challenge to try to take a big flat space of 8 or 10 or 15 acres and turn it into inviting spaces that you don't see all at one time but you sort of have to process through and walk through to really be able to enjoy and to really get the most out of. The home in particular, I love the way the home's laid out with uh, access from the front through the back. Um, the way our farm is set up is kind of similar and we do have the hill as well so the cross breeze coming through and the whole openness of the house and then the gardens extending down the hill behind um, the building is absolutely spectacular. I teach art and so I'm, I'm always expressing about color and using the color wheel and uh, warm and cool colors. He's got it exploded in this uh, great um, yard and, and presentation that he's done and I, you know, so that just fascinates me. Um, and the variety that he's used out here. I, I'm asking my husband, what do you think that is? And you know, all this. And so hopefully we can get some ideas, <laughs> get inspired. You know, you, there's no way you can't get inspired being out here on this property. It's absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful. beautiful. So we're, we're looking forward to getting the ideas and maybe hopefully putting these ideas in our yard too. It's been wonderful, it's breathtaking. I, there's just so much to look at. <laughs> Halloween has always been one of my favorite holidays. I suppose the levity that surrounds the festivities appeals to the prankster in me, and typically the weather is glorious at this time of the year. Last year we created an enormous bonfire for the party with a haunted twist. You see, at dusk when the light got really low, we lit the bonfire in the orchard, and out of the smoke and flames, ghostly figures emerged to join in on the party. There were also lots of little ghouls running around, kids in very creative costumes, which really set the mood. I decorated the area behind the house with gourds and jack-o'-lanterns, lots of them. Many were suspended from the arbors. And we set the table by covering it with burlap and then added bright green tablecloths, then added pumpkins, twigs, crows, cats, and candles to capture the spirit of the evening. I want to tell you a way of dealing with pests, which sounds like it comes right out of a horror movie. It's about an insect that lays an egg within the egg of one of these insects that are pillaging my vegetables. That insect hatches and devours its victim. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking cryptogramma wasp eggs and I'm placing them underneath these squash vines. And what will happen is that these little wasps will emerge and they will find eggs of insects that are pillaging my garden. Now let me do the math for you. In one of these little cups, there are 5,000 eggs which will hatch. 
each one of those little wasps will lay eggs within the eggs of another insect to the tune of about 100 in their short 8 to 10 day lifespan. So <laughs> I have 10 of these little cups in here. So I'm releasing 50,000 wasps. That's deploying quite an army against the bad bugs in the garden. Now you may be wondering where on earth does one find wasp eggs? Well, there are companies that deal with these sorts of things and will ship them out to you through the mail. And they arrive in these little snow cone cups like this. And all you need to do is keep them warm and in slightly humid place. That's what makes it perfect for summer placement because it's very humid out here in, in the middle of summer in the garden. So I think they're going to take to their new home very well. I know the name wasp frightens people, but this little wasp is one that doesn't sting or bite. So it's nothing to worry about. It's an absolute friend in the garden. As you know, one of the things I like to do is take pictures you send me. We throw them up on the Telestrator and have a look at them, come up with some ideas. And today we've got a beautiful house in southern Arkansas owned by Robin. And what Robin tells me about her house is it was built in 1949. It's a classic southern plantation style. Love the color, love the style, very good. Okay, so she asked, what about a circular driveway? Well, I think you can, you can manage that. It's a little hard to tell from this photograph whether we have enough room here for a circular driveway. But before we look at that, let's take a look at some of the, the plants that frame, frame the house. Um, for instance, here we have um, what looks like to be a very large Bradford pear, and then one over here that looks like it's been broken down, maybe in an ice storm. It's one of the problems with Bradford pears. They certainly have beautiful fall color and beautiful white flowers in the spring, but I think I would probably do away with these, just take them out. And um, these azaleas across the front have gotten too tall. You see, if we had a line that came across here, a little much lower, I think it would be better with taller azaleas in the back. And I think these containers are just a little too large here. All right, so with that said, let's talk about what we could do, and then let's take a look at that circular driveway idea. Um, I think what I would do over here on the ends, Robin, would be to put a pair of holly trees that could grow in a conical shape like this. They would be evergreen, lots of red berries in the winter. I like this boxwood idea very much here. It looks like you have a path. What I might do if I'm going to do a circular drive, though, is come out on either side here with a much more generous apron to this entryway. It's awfully crowded here and here. And then this driveway would come around like this, presumably. And I would keep it very simple. Um, I would do azaleas back here, but keep them lower. And I would probably go with a softer color pink azalea. And then reduce the size of these containers down to something that's about like this, because they're really sort of crowding that entryway. Then across the front, um, I think that you could come back with that low boxwood hedge, and that would be one of the few clipped parts across the front of this bed. They could sweep back around on the back side of those hollies. So it's a very symmetrical house, so it's important, Robin, that you keep the symmetry in place with the plantings. And then over here on the other, on either side, I should say, um, I would do some sort of a, a tree here bring it to the foreground, and then one over here, and I'm hoping you've got enough room for that, it's a little hard to see, but maybe a sugar maple or a red maple on either side, then that would really frame the house. Now you could take boxwood and come around the center circle with boxwood, um, and then you could just keep lawn in the center, or one of the things that I like to do in these cases is just simply, if you don't do the border of boxwood, just on this inside do some big, four big gumdrop shaped boxwoods that would define, or maybe five or six around the circle and just leave it at that and leave the lawn over here. Keep it as simple as possible. But just make this apron, this space here more generous. And you may need a walk that comes across here. If you do, I would let it come all the way across and around here to the other side of the house, keeping it all symmetrical. Robin, I hope that helps. You have a beautiful house. Good luck with your project. Mm. Your taste 
tasty. I do. I love this mm, on enchiladas. So good. Isn't it good? Welcome to the kitchen. I'm here with my friend Cappy. It's the dog days of summer, but one of the most delightful vegetables that comes out of the garden is corn. And Cappy is preparing uh, corn on the cob, Mexican style. Now, is this peaches and cream? This is peaches and cream, a bicolor uh, corn. And I like to steam it. I would never, never, never boil corn because yeah. that just destroys the flavor. Oh. Or you could grill it. Yeah. And if you grill it, you can simply soak this in water mm -hmm. so the husk won't burn. Yeah. And tie it with some kitchen twine, throw it on the grill, and then you've got a little nifty. Handle. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Now let's go back to why you don't boil it. Is it because it reduces the flavor, the intensity Completely. of the flavor? The kernels are, are so tender, yeah. it absorbs the water. Yeah. So if you don't introduce water to mm. the corn and mm. just simply steam or grill, you get the full flavor. Yeah, of the excellent. Kernel. You know, I think that the best time uh, to, to eat sweet corn is as soon as it comes off the stalk. The longer it um, lies about after harvesting, it tends to go from that sweet milk to starch. Definitely. But I hope you grow some corn next year. Well, I know. You know, when we took a walk through the garden, I do miss seeing the corn. We really need more space to really grow corn properly. But um, I'm, I'm certainly uh, intrigued by the idea. Well. The steaming is so easy. It's only going to take uh, five to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And you could do this earlier in the day and then just heat it up in the steam basket. Oh, I see. That's good, particularly if you're having guests. Exactly. Definitely plan on two ears per person mm, that because good? it is that good. I usually don't tell people what's in it because it sounds weird, mayonnaise and corn. <laughs> but that's their traditional way to make it. So, so, so easy. Take the corn. Okay. Steam it while it's still warm. Okay. Slather it with the mayonnaise. Look at that. And then we're going to sprinkle it with the cotija cheese. And the mayonnaise will help it adhere. Mm -hmm. And just roll it around. Mm -hmm. And then sprinkle it with a little bit of cayenne pepper. Okay. It's going to really contrast nicely with the sweetness of the corn. And then a yep. squeeze of fresh lime. Okay. And you got to try this. How beautiful. Look at that. Oh my heavens. I told you. What a way to have yeah, corn. Isn't it great? Oh, it's fabulous. Now I want to ask one question about the amount of cheese that one should have on hand uh, to do. Let's say you're going to do a dozen ears, you're having six people over. A couple of cups of couple corn. A couple of cups, mm -hmm. all right. Maybe a mm -hmm. cup, cup or so of mayonnaise. A dozen ears of corn. About three limes and your cayenne pepper. And that little tanginess from Ooh. the lemon and the mayonnaise Ooh. with the cheese and the lime and the No, I was going to say the lime will really set it off. Yeah. Yeah. Cappy, thank you so much for sharing this thank recipe Thank you, Alan. With us. Thank you. Well, do give this a try. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope along the way you picked up a few tips that will inspire you to spend more time outdoors and entertain friends and family there. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.